Uh, it's certainly good to be with you here at Fountain in the City again this afternoon. And we've got a fascinating subject to study together. Uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you here this afternoon. I trust that you are comfortable and uh, looking forward to uh, an interesting time together. As I met and mingled earlier today, I, I, I met people from Jamaica, you know, the home of Usain Bolt. Imagine. We have people here from Jamaica today. We've got people from Tamworth, uh, people from different parts of the country and different parts of the world. Wherever you are from, please feel at home. You are part of our family today, and we pray that the Lord will bless you and uh, give you a, a rich blessing as we worship together today. We've got an important subject that we're going to look at from God's Word. And so before we open the Scriptures, I want to just pause for a moment to ask the Lord's special blessing on our program this afternoon. Please bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to praise you, to honor you, and to worship you this afternoon. And as we open the sacred word, the Holy Scriptures, we invite your presence to be with us. Lord, we come to learn at your feet. And so we pray that you will give us wisdom and understanding as we study the scriptures together today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, our subject today is entitled Rest for the Soul. And down through history, men and women, the world's great men and women, have endeavored to alter the course of history. Their actions, their decisions affect us even today. Yes, the world's great men and women have tried to alter the course of history. And their actions and achievements have influenced millions and are still doing so today. In fact, they're influencing us as we sit here this afternoon. Some have tried to rule by might and power. Down through the centuries, we know them by name. Cyrus the Great, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar and the other mighty and powerful Roman Caesars, Genghis Khan, who led the great Mongol hordes right across Europe, right across Asia and, and to the very borders and on into, into Europe itself. And then there was Charlemagne, Napoleon, and Adolf Hitler. But their empires are no longer with us. Their empires have disappeared. Because you see, no matter how numerous their weapons, no matter how great their army, ultimately, ultimately, they must rule by means other than force if they are to retain power, authority, and influence. Ultimately, any person who wants to have a lasting influence must rule by persuasion. And that's why the people who have made the greatest and the most lasting impact on our world are individuals who have introduced concepts and ideas that have persuaded and influenced millions of Earth's inhabitants. You see, through their ideas, their concepts, their philosophies, they have reached into the minds of millions. In their own generation and in generations that have followed. And by influencing and controlling people's minds, in a sense, they have ruled the world. Not by might, not by power, because you see, the pen is mightier than the sword, and it's words and ideas that can really change the world. And so, we know individuals that 
using thoughts and ideas and philosophies and concepts who have influenced millions of people through many, many generations. I think of Buddha, Aristotle, Plato, the great Greek philosophers, Jesus Christ, Muhammad, Galileo, Newton, Copernicus, and so we could go on. All have made a massive impact on the world, and they have changed history by introducing new concepts, new ideas, new philosophies, discoveries. We know them by name today. And the last two centuries have seen some of the most influential thought makers of all time. Charles Darwin, who introduced the concept of, of evolution. Karl Marx, who introduced modern communism. Albert Einstein, the great scientist. Sigmund Freud, the great uh, philosopher, come uh, s dealt with the minds of people. Mahatma Gandhi, peaceful protest. These great ideas people, these great thought makers have generated concepts and, and philosophies that have been grasped by the masses. Concepts that have changed the world. Today, we are going to consider one of the great thought makers, arguably the most influential of all time. And as we consider this great thought maker that has influenced our society like no other, we make our way to South England, to the beautiful county of Kent. What a name. The Garden of England. And there we come to a small country village by the name of Down. And on the outskirts of the village, we find Down House. And it was here at Down House that the most influential book published in the last 200 years was written. In fact, it was written right here in the study. Now, if I was to ask you, what is the most influential book to have been written in the last 200 years, I wonder which book you would name, thinking of all the, the great people who have written in the last 200 years. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the most influential book written in the last 200 years was written by this man, Charles Robert Darwin. The book that he wrote, The Origin of Species. This book, The Origin of Species, written in Down, primarily written mainly in, in Down House, initiated one of the great changes in the way humans view themselves and life around them. This book, The Origin of Species, has done more than any other to shape modern thought. It initiated the greatest revolution of all time concerning man's view of himself in relation to God and to the world around him. This book, The Origin of Species, has changed the trend of religion. It has changed psychology. It's changed the teaching of history, biology, literature, and morality. And much of the behavior patterns we see in our world today have come about due to the writings of Charles Darwin and his book, The Origin of Species. The way we think, the way we plan, the way we behave has been influenced by this man, Charles Darwin. His book, The Origin of Species, brought about a complete change in our modern world. Charles Darwin grew up in a well-to-do home. In fact, his grandfather was a famous physician. 
He was a, a physician of such high standing that he was invited to the royal palace to be the king's personal doctor. And so young Charles wanted to follow the family tradition and on finishing school he made his way to the beautiful city of Edinburgh in Scotland. And there he attended medical school, studying to be a doctor, a physician like his forebears. But you know, in those days, when they performed surgery, they didn't use anesthetic. Can you imagine what it was like? It was too much for our man, Charles Darwin. And so he forgot about medicine and he made his way to Cambridge. And at Cambridge, he took up the study of the Bible. He studied theology, and uh, there it was that he graduated from Christ College in 1831. And at the age of 22, young Charles Darwin was prepared to take the title of the Reverend Darwin to a small country town where he would be the, the pastor, as it were, of a small country Anglican church. But then something happened that changed the course of history. Instead of becoming the Reverend Darwin, he decided that rather than be a preacher of the Bible, he accepted an invitation to become a naturalist aboard the HMS Beagle. And with the captain and his crew, he sailed on the Beagle on a trip that took him around the world studying nature, studying wildlife, the natural world. A, a, a wonderful journey, a wonderful journey. And he saw some wonderful things and some wonderful, beautiful places. But of all the places that Charles Darwin visited, the one of supreme importance was the Galapagos Islands. Now, to just put the Galapagos Islands in, uh, in the picture, it's up here off the coast of South America, about a thousand kilometers off the, the west coast of South America, lie the islands of the Galapagos. There are about 13 main islands on the Galapagos. And the wildlife there is like no other place on earth. It's kind of tame. The, the creatures, the animals on the Galapagos Islands are not fearful of man. And so these islands, as I mentioned, there are about 13 of them and many, many smaller ones. Here it was that Darwin began to, to study in earnest and to be influenced and amazed by the magnificent wildlife here on the Galapagos Islands. Wildlife that was not afraid of, of him as he, as he went about his study. You see, these islands and the waters surrounding them hold an estimated, listen to it, 1,900 unique plant and animal species that are found nowhere else on, the, on earth. So for a naturalist, a lover of the natural world like Charles Darwin, this was the place to be. On the day that Charles Darwin stepped ashore on the Galapagos Island, a new era of world history began. You see, Darwin was immediately struck by the, the number of unique plants and animals in this one place. And he began to, to ask the big questions. How did it get here? How did life begin? How had all this variety come about in this one isolated place, this, this one isolated region of the world? Darwin was particularly fascinated by the finches on the islands. All finches, these birds that he began to study, but their beaks were different. They were similar, these birds, these finches, but their beaks were a different shape on each island. And the shape of their beaks depended 
on the type of food available on the island. So imagine, you've got all these, these are 13 or so, and many smaller islands, finches on each of the islands, very similar, but their beaks were different. And their beaks were different depending on the food available on that particular island. On one island, for example, the, the finches had strong beaks for cracking nuts. But on other islands, they needed a different shaped beak, pardon me, to feed on the fruit. On another island, it would be a different beak altogether to feed on the seeds or whatever it was a, that they fed on on that particular island. Darwin was very excited by this discovery. And as he documented the, the variations in the finches with their, with their funny shaped beaks, he began to develop the theory of evolution. Little did anyone realize that the ideas sown in Darwin's mind on the Galapagos Islands would divide history in half. You see, my friends, before Darwin, belief in God, the Creator, had been accepted by almost everyone in the Western world. Everybody just believed the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created. So up until this time, virtually everyone accepted and believed that. But after Darwin, faith in a creator God would become impossible, even irrelevant for most people in the Western world. Darwin, at the close of his journey, made his way to eventually to, to the village of Down and here at Down House. He continued to study and to, to research and to develop his theory of evolution. And he wrote the book right here in this study. It was here that he penned his conclusions and wrote the most influential book in modern history. The Origin of Species. And in it, Darwin's theory of evolution suggested that all life on Earth, all of it, plant and animal species, evolved gradually over millions and millions of years through a series of steps or, or slight changes or modifications. Behind the theory of evolution lay a challenge to what the Bible said about how life on earth began. How it was create how this earth and life on this earth was created in six days. And so after Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, there were now two views on how the world was made and how humans fitted into it. There were now two views. There was the Bible's view and there was Darwin's view, the origin of species view. And before long, the scientific community largely accepted Darwin's position outlined in his book, The Origin of Species. By and large, the scientific community adopted Darwin's view, accepted his theory of evolution. And then it was that the wider scholarly world followed and also embraced the theory of evolution. And today, my friends, you can go to almost any school, college, or university in this country, or around the world for that matter, and you'll find that virtually every one of them teaches the theory of evolution as if it was an established fact. Is that not right? The theory of evolution has influenced millions around the world to reject the idea of a creator God and to believe rather that humans, mankind, evolved over millions and millions of years. Because of Charles Darwin, we today are living in a different era. 
a different era. Before Darwin, God was the answer to life's big questions. Isn't that right? Why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? If you wanted answers to those questions, this is where you turn for those answers. But today, after Charles Darwin and his book, The Origin of Species, people look to evolution for the big answers to life's questions. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? The two positions are radically different. Radically different. Evolution and the Bible are incompatible. Evolution and creation, Bible creation, are diametrically opposed to each other. They are opposites. You can't believe the two of them. Now, friends, you might say, well, so what? I want you to notice in answering that question, the natural progression when the theory of evolution is carried right through to its logical conclusion. You see, once the theory of evolution is accepted, the first three chapters of this book, the Bible, the first three chapters of the book of, of, uh, of Genesis that uh, tell about creation become nothing but a series of myths. Isn't that right? So follow with me evolution's lineup and evolution's conclusion. Evolution teaches that there is no God. There is no God. And if there is no God, there is no creator. If there is no creator, what's this nonsense about Adam? If there is no creator, there is no Adam. If there is no Adam, then there is no Eve. If there is no Eve, then there is no fall into sin. If there is no sin, why do we need a saviour? Do you follow me? If there is no saviour, there is no good news that we call the gospel. If there is no gospel, there is no divine law. So again... We might ask, what does it matter? Who cares? My friends, we are dealing with one of the most important issues that faces people today. You see, Darwin's theory of evolution has influenced millions of Earth's inhabitants and has dramatically altered, influenced, changed the thinking of society today. The theory of evolution has been largely responsible for the decline in Christianity in recent years. Just think of this for a moment. In Britain, where Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, where he introduced his theory of evolution, less than 7% of the population attend church today. If this rate of decline continues, less than 1% in Britain will attend church in the year 2016. Imagine that. Imagine that. In Australia, just, to, just follow with me, just think about this, here in our own country. In Australia, church attendance rates have been among the lowest in the world and they continue to decline. In the 1960s, 41% of the population attended church each weekend. In the 1980s, it was down to 25 you know what it is today? Less than 8% who attend church regularly each week. You see, friends, Darwin's theory of evolution has been accepted by the masses. Once you accept Darwin's theory of evolution, this book becomes nothing 
but a compilation of myths and legends and ancient stories, not to be taken seriously. And so Darwin's theory of evolution has been accepted by the masses and has played a leading role in leading people to throw out the concept of God. It's played a leading role in people no longer believing in God or worshipping God. My friends, it's important to see the spread of evolution in the context of the great controversy, the great conflict between God and Satan, between good and evil. In our recent program called The War Zone, we discovered that the Bible teaches us. It's one of the great themes of the Bible that there is a great conflict between God and Satan. There is a great controversy between good and evil. You remember where it began? It began in heaven. It began in heaven. And then it moved to planet Earth. Do you remember the issues in this conflict between God and Satan? One of the big issues is worship. You remember Satan, Lucifer, the archangel, he craved the worship that belonged to God. Remember he said, look, I'm so wise, I'm so magnificent, I'm so wonderful, why shouldn't I receive that worship? And so worship was one of the central issues in this conflict between God and Satan, between good and evil. And then there was the issue of God's law. Satan said, listen, we don't need a, a law, a divine law. I've got a better way of doing it. I want to give you freedom so that you can forget about the law of God. I've got a better way. Let me run the universe and I'll show you a better way. So worship... God's law. And then the third big issue was obedience. You don't have to obey. God is so arbitrary, so demanding. You see, friends, the theory of evolution teaches that there is no creator. And if there's no creator, then there's no God to worship. It teaches that we can disregard what's this God's law business. You see, if there is no God, then how can there be God's law? And then there, of course, can be no God to obey. Darwin's theory of evolution has been accepted by the masses, and let me say again, is playing a leading role in people no longer believing in God or worshipping the God of the Bible. Now, of course, the question arises, well, how does God respond to an attack like this? What does God do? What is his plan? What is God's answer? Well, my friends, in the very last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, God has a special message to prepare people, men and women, for Christ's return. I want to read it to you here. It's found in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. And I'm starting to read here at verse 7. Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. And notice as I read further. And worship Him, notice, who worship Him, which him? Worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. Do you notice what it says? It's a call to worship. And it's a call to worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the springs or the fountains of water. And so my friends... In an age, our modern age, when uh, evolution, this theory of evolution, has led millions to believe that there is no creator, there is no God, 
God sends a message, a special message, urging people to return to the worship of the Creator. It's a message that challenges the very fabric of the theory of evolution. You see, all through the Bible, really from Genesis to Revelation, the fact that God is the Creator is held out in this book as distinguishing Him from all false gods who never created anything. The very basis of worship is the fact that we are God's creatures. He made us. And that is what distinguishes the true God from all false gods. And so, whenever God wishes to prove that He is God, the one and only true God, He refers to the fact that He is the Creator. The reason God is worthy of our worship is that He made us and He made the world. Listen to what the Bible says. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things. Why is God worthy of our worship? Because you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And so, my friends, in an age when the theory of evolution has taken the scientific world by storm and has been accepted by the masses, God sends a message calling people to worship the Creator. And my friends, the differences between these two theories has never been more stark than today. And the question that comes to you and to me is simply this. How can we acknowledge then that God is our creator? How do we stand out and how are we distinguished as individuals who accept that God is the creator of heaven and earth? God himself says that this is the distinguishing fact the, the distinguishing fact that separates the true God from all the false gods, the fact that He is the Creator. So how do you and I identify with God being the Creator? How can we worship Him who made the heavens and the earth? Well, friends, again, we will let the Bible answer because right in the very heart of God's law, Remember the Ten Commandments that were given at Sinai? We studied them together last week. You know, the Ten Commandments were, were so important that God himself wrote them with his own finger. Too important to be left to anyone else. God himself came down and wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. And you remember we saw last week that when God came down on Mount Sinai, he gave the human race a blueprint for living. Here in the Ten Commandments, God tells us how to live. Remember the arrangement of the Ten Commandments? The first four tell us who to worship, or the first one tells us who to worship. The second one tells us how to worship. The third one tells us the approach to worship. And the fourth one tells us when to worship. And I want to read you what it says. Right here in the very heart of the Ten Commandments, written by God's own finger. Listen to what it says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of who? The Lord your God. Why is it the Sabbath? He tells us right here in the Ten Commandments. Listen to what he says. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested which day? The seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You see, friends, the Sabbath, the seventh day of each week is a day for remembering. 
a day for remembering. It's a day for remembering and acknowledging the Creator. The Creator is be, who has been so carelessly challenged by our generation, challenged by the theory of evolution, that theory that developed in the mind of Charles Darwin and others and was so brilliantly outlined in the book, The Origin of Species. So in a day when the theory of evolution is dominating our, the, 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 the teachings and the instructions in our schools, our colleges and universities, God has a message calling men and women back to a belief in a creator God. Notice as we, as we read further, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Why? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And so, my friends, by respecting according to the Bible, by respecting the Sabbath, we demonstrate our allegiance to God the Creator. Respecting the Sabbath is God's appointed way of acknowledging Him as the Creator. It separates those who believe in God the Creator from those who believe that we evolved over billions and billions of years. In this modern age of evolution, God is calling His people. In this age, the Sabbath calls us back to the worship of our Creator. In order to better understand this, <clears throat> let's go back to the Bible record of Creation Week. Right back to the very start, the book of Genesis, the book of Origins, and read about when God created the world. Listen to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1 where it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. So in chapter 1 it talks about the six days of creation and what was created on each of those six days. And then here in chapter 2 it says, Thus the heavens and the earth, they were completed in all their vast array. And I want you to notice what he says in the remainder of this verse and the one following. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. And so on the seventh day, what did he do? He rested from all his work. Notice as we read in, in verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day. Notice what, that, notice what happens here. God blessed the seventh day. Now it says, he rested on the seventh day. Now it says, and God blessed the seventh day, and he made it what? Holy. And he made it holy. Because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. You see, friends, God created the Sabbath at the origin of this world. Right there at the very beginning. And you notice that it was God who made and kept the first Sabbath day. Do you notice what it says there that we read? And God rested on the seventh day. And so it was God who not only made the first Sabbath, but it was God who kept the Sabbath. Now, not only does the Bible, and not only does the Bible tell us that God made the Sabbath day, it tells us, it goes into detail, and it tells us how He made the Sabbath day. What makes the seventh day of each week the Sabbath day? Notice what it says here. Genesis again, chapter 2 and verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day. Notice. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. My friends, it was God who made the Sabbath. And it tells us here how he made the Sabbath. First, God rested on the Sabbath. So what is it that makes the seventh day the Sabbath? 
God rested on that day. God blessed the Sabbath and God made it holy. And my friends, it took all three of these acts to make God's Sabbath. You see, the seventh day is the only day that God ever blessed. It's the only day that God ever made holy. It's the only day that God ever set aside for people to keep. That's why it's called the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Do you notice? It's not man's Sabbath. It's God's Sabbath. It's the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Now, friends, let me tell you something very important. Only God can make a day holy. Only God can make a day a Sabbath. And so no human being can make a Sabbath or change the Sabbath from one day to another. This honor is totally in the hands of the Almighty God. And so right there at the beginning of the world, God gave the Sabbath to humanity as a memorial of His creative power. I want you to think with me for a moment. Think of time. Think of time as we know it. You know, all the measurements that we use, the second, the minute, the hour, the day, the month, the year, all of these measurements are determined by the movements of the heavenly body. Isn't that right? For example, the, the second, the minute, the hour, the day, the month, the year, they're all determined by the movements of the heavenly bodies. For example, a day, 24 hours, is how long it takes for the earth to rotate once on its own axis. What about a month? A month is determined, it's the time it takes the moon to travel once around our earth. And what about the year? That's the amount of time it takes for our earth to travel once completely right around the sun. All of these measurements, second, minute, hour, day, month, year, they're all determined by the movement of the heavenly bodies. But there's one exception, and that is the week. Where does the week come from? This seven-day cycle. The week is not determined by the movement of the heavenly bodies. Where does it come from? Where does the week originate? My friends, it originates in the book of Genesis. It originates in the very hand of God. The only explanation, the only or, uh, explanation for the origin of the week is found in the book of Genesis, creation week. The only logical explanation for the week is the Bible account of creation. God made the wor world in six days, and what did he do on the seventh? He rested. He rested. And there, my friends, we have the origin of the week. It was at creation that God gave us the weekly cycle with the Sabbath as the last day of the week. And my friends, the rhythm of the seven-day cycle is ingrained in the human psyche. It's in our DNA, as it were. On the seventh day of each week, God gives people a memorial of His creative power. And isn't it amazing? It doesn't matter where you go in the world. You find people keep the week, do they not? They keep the week. People have tried to change the week. You know, they try to change the week in France. They try to change the number of days in the week. The French wanted how many days in the week? How many would you think? Ten. Of course, ten. <laughs> the Russians, the communists, wanted a longer working week. 
But you know, friends, when they tried to impose another weekly cycle, the animals and humans failed to cope with the change. It affected the way they worked, the way they lived, the way they operated, the way they functioned, and it didn't work. And so as hard as mankind has tried to change this weekly cycle, and that's why I say it's ingrained in our very psyche, the seven-day cycle, the seven-day week. And so, my friends, the seventh-day Sabbath was created by God as a memorial to His creative power. The Sabbath is God's holy day. And the Sabbath was so important that God took it and He placed it right in the very heart of His Ten Commandment law. God gave us these Ten Commandments to show us how to live. And of all the things that God wanted His people to do, the Sabbath was placed in his top ten list of priorities. And friends, let me tell you something amazing. Sabbath keepers today live five to ten healthier, happier years than their next door neighbors who don't. Doesn't that tell us something? God has a plan. And if we follow that plan, we will benefit because we were designed on the weekly cycle and the first six days are for work and the seventh day is to be a day of rest, a day of worship, a day for relationships. A day for relationships. You see, friends, we human beings are designed for communication with others. Our lives revolve around the relationships that we establish. Isn't that right? Our God is a God of relationships. In fact, if you look at the Ten Commandment law, the Ten Commandments, God's divine law, the first four deal with God's relationship or our relationship to God. The second six deal with our relationship with our fellow human beings. We are gregarious creatures. We live together. Just look how many of us have crowded into Sydney. We like company. We like to relate. And when we fail to be able to relate, we're in trouble. And friends, the Sabbath is all about relationships. That's why God's given it to us. It's a day for us to spend strengthening our relationship with God. It's a day for us to spend strengthening our relationships with our family members. It's a day for us to strengthen our relationship with our church family. That's what the Sabbath's all about. It's God's special day. It's God's special blessed day for us. For us. And when we reject God, when we reject His Sabbath, we suffer. We suffer. And friends, that's what the Sabbath is all about. It's a reminder that we belong to a great, all-powerful, all-loving God. And when we say a loving God, it talks immediately about relationships, doesn't it? Of course. It's a day to spend with Him. It's a day to spend with our family. It's what the Sabbath's for. I was just reading about the amount of Money, because isn't that, we measure everything by money in our society. Doesn't that say something to us? The, am the amount of money that is lost each year because people are under stress. It's a phenomenal amount. We live in a society that is stressed to the limit, to breaking point. But my friends, the Sabbath is God's answer to the stress problem. 
work for six days and leave it alone for 24 hours. And it will be a balm to your soul. It will be medication to your body. The best medication possible. Rest. Glorious rest. Amen. That's why God says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no work. No work. Leave the work alone for a 24-hour period and see the difference that it makes to your physical body, to your mind, and to your soul. What a blessing, my friends. But like too many of the blessings that God gives us, we push it aside. Why? Because we are just too busy. Oh, my friends, the Sabbath is one of the great blessings that God has given the human race. And it's so important that he placed it right in the very heart of his Ten, Commandments, Ten Commandment law. And let me say this, friends. Anybody who disregards the Sabbath today is disregarding God's holy commandments. It was... God, the Lord himself, who created the world. And the Sabbath was created at the same time. And he then placed the Sabbath in the very heart of his Ten Commandments. God in these last days has spoken to us by his Son. Who is it that made the world? Let me tell you, friends, listen to what the Word says. God in these last days has spoken to us by His Son, through whom He made what? The world. Do you see who it was who created this world of ours? It was God the Son. God who created all things by who? By Jesus Christ. Listen to how clearly John, John's Gospel makes this point. He, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made by who? By Him. And the world knew Him not. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. This, my friends, is talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus made this world. He made human beings. Do you see what this means? It means that Jesus is our creator. Jesus made this world. And Jesus made human beings. Jesus is our creator. And my friends, it is Jesus who calls us to keep the Sabbath day holy. You see, seeing it is Jesus who made the Sabbath, that makes it the Christian Sabbath, does it not? It was also Jesus, the Son of God, who wrote the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And so it's Jesus, the lawgiver, who calls us to keep the Sabbath. It's Jesus, the Savior, who calls us to keep the Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath is a part of following Jesus. He is our example, and that's why every time the Bible mentions the Sabbath in relation to Jesus, we find Jesus keeping the Sabbath as it should be kept. You know, before Jesus commenced his work as the Messiah, he lived and he worked as a carpenter in Nazareth. That was the family business. Those hands of Jesus learned first to, to work with wood, and Jesus worked in the carpenter shop right through the week. But the question is, what did Jesus do on the Sabbath? Friends, the Bible makes it very clear how Jesus kept the Sabbath. Listen to what it says in Luke, the fourth chapter and verse 16. It says here, He went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath, he went into the synagogue as his custom was and he stood up to read. It was his custom to go to a place of worship every Sabbath. It was his habit. It's what he did every week. My friends, when Jesus was here on earth, it was his custom, his habit, to worship, to observe the Sabbath according to the Bible. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus is our example in all things, in everything particularly in relation 
to obedience to the Ten Commandments. Oh, my friends, the example of Jesus is very clear. It was Jesus' custom to worship on the seventh-day Sabbath. And as a follower of Jesus, as one who calls himself a Christian, I want to do what Jesus did. I want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. But you know, my friends, there's a strange situation in our world today. With the same Christ as our example, the same Bible as our guide, Two days are kept in the Christian world today, isn't that right? The seventh day Sabbath and the first day of the week. Does it really matter which day I keep holy? Which of the two should we observe as the Sabbath? Or is any day, just any old day acceptable to God? You know, friends, the Bible makes it very clear that the Lord has a day. If you go to the very last book of the Bible and read Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, I want you to listen very carefully to what it says here. It says, on the Lord's day. So it's talking about a day that belongs to the Lord. Isn't that right? On the Lord's day. Now this is after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, the last book of the Bible that was written. Written some time after Jesus returned to heaven. But you notice it says that even in New Testament times, the Lord has a day. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. So friends, notice the Bible says that the Lord has a day. Now the question is, well, which day is the Lord's day? Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 8, friends, because the Bible gives us all the information we need. There need be no confusion on this subject whatsoever if we follow the Bible and the Bible only. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord of which day? Of the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So we know then that the Lord has a day, and we know that the Lord's day is the Sabbath day. Now the question, of course, arises, well, which day is the Sabbath day? How do we know which day is the Sabbath? Notice again, friends, what the Bible tells us back here in Exodus, the 20th chapter, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 10. Notice what it says here. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the, which day? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So notice, friends, what the Bible says. The Lord has a day. The Lord's day is the Sabbath day. And the seventh day is the Sabbath day. Notice, the Lord has a day. That day is the Sabbath. And the seventh day is the Sabbath. Oh, my friends, the Bible is clear. The Bible is clear. God considered the Sabbath so important that he made it one of the Ten Commandments. God knows which day is the Sabbath. God says the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. The big question, of course, is, is this. Well, what's going on? Barrett, why don't you just come here for a moment and, uh, and join me? We have here a real, a real conundrum, don't we? I mean, we've got, a, we've got an issue here. It seems that Jesus kept the Sabbath. And it seems that the Bible clearly tells us which day is the Sabbath. The, the evidence is here, but it seems that most of Christendom worship on another day today. That always used to fascinate me. And I thought to myself, one day I'm going to find the answers, because there must be answers, because this is an issue that is so clearly before us. And so I used to, in fact, 30 years ago, the pastor of my church that I belong to. I raised it with him, I said, well, the Bible says, the seventh day Sabbath, 
And I've met these people, they're a bit weird. They worship on a Seventh-day Sabbath. I said, can you explain to me why we worship on a Sunday? And he said to me, he said, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I'll get back to you. <laughs> and that 30 years ago, I wonder if I still might get that phone call. Now, I didn't wait the 30 years. But I, I know, Baron, you've looked into this. You've uh, gone into yes, the history. You, yes. you're, you're a European by birth. Yeah. You've looked at, at the source of this. Yeah. And uh, so let me just say, I've, I've asked my colleague, Baron, who's investigated the historical evidence for the change, why it is that some people worship on, on, on Sunday, where did that come from, when did it begin? Friends, the information's there. Let me tell you this. It's one of the great conspiracies of all time. Isn't that right, Byron? Oh, oh absolutely. Friends, it's something you need to know about. Here God tells us we should worship on the seventh day Sabbath, but most people today, Christians, Worship on another day of the week. And, not only and we need to know why. How did this happen? This is the wonderful thing. You know the Bible actually predicted? Right in the Old Testament there are predictions that the day would be changed. In fact, it even identified the entity that would change from the seventh day to the first day. So all that information is predicted it is in all the Bible. There. Plus the fact, the amazing thing is I discovered also that the Bible even predicted the rejection as God as a creator full stop. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Friends, evolution didn't take God by surprise. No. No. So, so, so Barrett, next week, next could week, you uh, share that information? I, shall be, I know yeah. that everybody here will want to see yeah. the evidence yeah. so that we can all know what the issues are and how this change came about. Because in yeah. reality, we're talking about something extremely serious here. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. You know, I, I thought, as you said, you know, who cares? What does it matter? You know, one in seven, that'll do it. It's amazing, though, that God placed a tremendous emphasis. He called it a sign. He said it was a matter of allegiance. It was a matter of choice. Loyalty. Loyalty. You name it. And that did it for me. If God insists, hey, why would I fight it? Friends, next week, you're going to see the evidence for yourself. Barnes research this, and I want you to see the evidence with your own eyes. So don't miss next week, whatever you do. You're going to enjoy next week's presentation by Barnes. Sure. Barnes, thank, thank you. you very much. We look forward to it. Let's bow our heads and we'll close with a word of prayer. Great Creator God, Lord of the Sabbath day, Savior of mankind, we bow before you to honor you to praise you, to worship you as creator of this world. And Lord, we want to demonstrate our allegiance by living for you and by keeping the day that you've set aside to demonstrate that we belong to you. I ask your blessing upon each person present here this evening. Lord, take us safely to our homes. Give us a good week and bring us back again next week to study more from your word, the Bible. And Father, we look forward to the day when Jesus will come as King of kings and Lord of lords. And it is my prayer that each one of us will be found ready and waiting to meet you so that we can spend eternity in your kingdom and even there worship you every Sabbath day. This is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Good evening, friends. God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you again next Sabbath afternoon. Good afternoon, and may God bless you.